Uh, what I'm going to start by telling you about is uh, microbes, just to introduce you to microbes and how they survive, um, and then look at how and why human infectious diseases have changed over the ages. Asking the questions, how have microbes affected our history? And finally, ending up with looking at the question, are we better or worse off than our ancestors were? So let's get started. And I want to start right back at the beginning with the origins of life. Um, the planet formed, Earth formed about 4.6 billion years ago. And the first life forms appeared about 4 billion years ago, uh, probably shortly after the planet had cooled enough uh, for there to be water on the planet, because all life requires water. And what we have here is a 12-hour clock uh, depicting life on Earth, basically, and when it evolved. Um, and what I really want to point out to you in this is just how long microbes had the planet entirely to themselves. So uh, the first life forms, which were microbes, primitive bacteria, uh, as I say, appeared about 4 billion years ago, around about here. And for all this time here, uh, they had the planet to themselves. They evolved um, to uh, grow in every niche upon the planet, and they diversified very much more than any life forms have diversified since. Um, then the first hominids appeared uh, about a million years ago, and modern man evolved just 200,000 years ago, which is actually at one minute to midnight. So you can see from that uh, clock that um, microbes really have had the upper hand for a very, very long time. And it shows, I have to say. Now, how do microbes survive? Um, well, to survive, all living things must generate energy and they must reproduce. Um, that's a fairly obvious and basic statement. And microbes have evolved many different ways um, of, of making energy. They, all the rest of us on the planet uh, are locked in to uh, oxygen, using oxygen for respiration and giving off carbon dioxide. Um, and we therefore rely on photosynthesis uh, because um, if it wasn't for plants photosynthesizing, we would not have the oxygen uh, and the carbon dioxide would accumulate. So there's a balance there, but we are tied into that one system. Whereas microbes can use all sorts of things to make energy from. They can use sulfur, nitrogen, I think recently in the press uh, there was arsenic even that uh, they found some microbes using. And so they are um, uh, very much adapted um, to all the different niches on the planet, very much more than we are. Now, over the years, a few microbes um, have found that they can use other living things as a source of energy. And these uh, microbes are the parasites. And in doing so, some of these microbes cause disease. But this figure I have in brackets here is uh, a figure that one of my colleagues, in fact, in Edinburgh, has worked out is the number of microbes that cause disease in humans. And so 1,415 out of all the millions that there are out there uh, cause disease. And many, many of the other ones are actually keeping us alive, um, you know, uh, generating the nitrogen cycle and all the other things that they do to keep the planet uh, suitable for us to live on. So don't be too hard on them. Okay, uh, maybe 1,415 are a bit of a nuisance, but all the others are working in our favor, or many of them. Now, microbes are adapted to spreading between their hosts. They have to do that in order to stay alive. And I've just got some of the common uh, ways in which microbes spread uh, depicted on this slide here. So uh, close contact, and not just a handshake like that, but also uh, a kiss. Uh, sexual contact will spread microbes from one individual to another very efficiently. Uh, here's somebody sneezing, uh, producing uh, thousands, if not millions, of little mucus droplets, uh, each of which may be carrying a little load of microbes that then float in the air to be inhaled by uh, the next susceptible person. And this airborne spread is uh, the most efficient way that microbes spread in the developed world. Uh, in developing countries, uh, water is the most efficient way in which they spread from one individual to another because of this kind of contamination that you uh, see, unfortunately, in those countries. Uh, microbes also hitch a ride with various vectors. Here we have a mosquito that carries microbes uh, from one person to another, and there are many other um, types.
type of uh, animal uh, vectors um, that microbes use. And that's just four uh, types of spread. I would challenge anybody um, to think of a method of spread that a microbe might use that the microbe hasn't already thought of. Uh, they are spread in blood transfusions, in on injection needles, in transplanting organs even. I read in the um, medical press the other day that uh, uh, rabies had spread uh, in a trans... In, in fact, two transplanted organs from one individual went into two other individuals and both those people developed rabies because the person providing the organs had actually died of rabies without the, medical, the medics uh, realising that that was the cause of death. So, amazing. Now, they will get everywhere. And so they have to, uh, because they really have quite a difficult lifestyle. And for the point of view of this lecture, there are really just two sorts of microbes. Um, the acute infectious microbes and the persistent <coughs> microbes. And I've just got one slide on each to introduce them to you. And I should say that I'm using the word microbes to, de to cover um, any infectious uh, microscopic um, being, if you like. Um, bacteria, viruses, protozoa, and those kind of things. So it's a, it's a general term that I'm using. Um, so the acute infectious microbes have really quite a frantic lifestyle. They infect, and the flu, a virus is obviously a topical one to choose. They infect a susceptible individual, and they have to grow and replicate uh, really fast in that individual because the individual will be developing an immune response against them, which will kill them. So before they are killed off by the immune response, which takes about 10 days to develop, they must have, have produced their offspring, which then jump uh, to another host. And for the flu virus, this spreads obviously through the air. And they have to maintain this continuous chain of susceptible individuals in order to survive. Um, and if they don't um, keep this continuous train, chain of hosts, then they will die out. And so these are the type of microbes that cause acute epidemics and pandemics. And they mainly infect children because children are the ones who are the most susceptible. Once they've been infected once, they will become immune and not get infected again. So one feels rather sorry for them, really. They have a hectic lifestyle, but they are quite successful, as you know. And slightly more leisurely is the lifestyle of the persistent microbes. And these ones have a sort of different strategy. Uh, they infect an individual and actually manage to evade the immune response. They can hide away within that individual. And so they can colonize the person for life. And herpes virus infections are absolutely typical of this type of persistent infection. Uh, they, as I say, they hide in the body, and so the host is then acting as a reservoir uh, of that microbe. And uh, at some stage, obviously, the microbe has to move on, because otherwise it will die with its host. And so the infection tends to be reactivated over a lifetime uh, when it can pass on to the next generation of susceptible individuals. Um, there are eight human herpes viruses. And you may be surprised to hear that the majority of people in this room are probably carrying at this moment at least five or six of them. I know I am, and you may know that you are. But um, on the whole, they don't cause a problem, and that's very good for them and very good for us. But they will reactivate at a certain stage in the life of the individual so that they can spread to another person. And I'll come back to that when I'm talking more specifically about microbes. So with those two types of, of uh, infection in mind, I think we can pass on to look at how these microbes have behaved during what I'm calling the ages of man. The hunter-gatherers, the farming era, uh, moving on to town and city dwellers, travelers, traders and colonizers, and finally ending up with the modern era. So hunter-gatherers. Uh, if you'd been born anywhere between 200,000 years ago and 10,000 years ago, uh, you would have perhaps looked a bit like that. You would have been part of a small, isolated, mobile band of people, uh, probably 30 to 50 people, and a couple of extended families maybe, constantly on the move, foraging for food. You would have had no permanent dwelling, and you would have had a life expectancy of somewhere between 25 and 30 years. So the question that we need to ask ourselves is, 
what did these people die of and what kind of infections did they suffer from? Um, this is not an easy, these are not easy questions to answer because, of course, microbes don't need fossil records on the whole unless they happen to infect uh, bones or teeth. Um, they don't need fossil records. And so uh, a lot of information has been gleaned from modern uh, hunter-gatherers who are still present in the modern era. And this, of course, is not ideal because we don't really have any hunter-gatherer bands left who have not had contact with modern man. Um, but we do have some that we can glean information from. So the answer is, uh, rather surprisingly, that these hunter-gatherers probably did not um, have any problems with acute infectious microbes. But they probably did have problems uh, with the persistent type of microbes that I've described to you. And the reason that they didn't have problems with the acute infectious microbes is that they were such small isolated communities that um, the acute infectious microbes just couldn't have got a foothold in them. Um, and it's certainly true today in the uh, few hunter-gatherer tribes that are left, if they have contact with the outside world and, for example, get infected with the measles virus, yes, this virus rips through the whole community because they are all susceptible. But once it has infected the, the 30 to 50 people in the band, it has nowhere to go and it will die out. Um, and so it won't be until another susceptible individual from the tribe contacts the measles virus again that it will um, infect the children that have been born since the last um, epidemic. And so uh, really, these acute infectious microbes did not exist um, as infecting uh, the hunter-gatherers. But the persistent virus certainly did. The lifestyle of the persistent herpes virus, for example, um, are absolutely in tune with uh, the isolated bands of humans that I've been describing because they cause a persistent infection that can pass from one generation to the next. And uh, the ones I want to briefly mention to you are the herpes virus called varicella zoster virus, which is the one that causes chicken pox. Um, tuberculosis, a bacteria which causes a persistent infection, and uh, a vector-borne microbe uh, that causes trypanosomiasis or sleeping sickness. And firstly, the chickenpox virus. Now, I, as you, I'm sure, all know, chickenpox is extremely common among children. It's a very, very successful virus in that it infects nearly every child. Um, and although uh, it causes a rash like this, very familiar, and although it clears up in something like 10 days to two weeks and you think it's all over, in fact, it isn't all over. Uh, while the uh, infection is ongoing, uh, the virus is multiplying in, these, in the rash, in the spots in the skin, and some of the virus particles are infecting the nerve fibers in the skin and actually climbing up the nerve fibers all the way to the central nervous system uh, where they get to the nucleus of the nerve cell and they can sit there undetected by the immune system for the life of the individual. So any of you who have had uh, chickenpox, and I assume that's the majority of you, will be carrying this virus. It uh, goes latent in these nerve fibers and it may never reactivate, but, but if it does reactivate, it's generally in older age and uh, it will come down a single nerve fiber uh, because it's in the nerve, and here it is uh, coming down a single nerve fiber, causing the rash all the way down, and this is the typical rash of shingles. Uh, it's a painful rash. This is in the longest nerve in the body, the sciatic nerve, which runs all the way from the thigh to the heel. Um, and that rash consists of thousands of little vesicles which contain thousands of virus particles. And I think you can see how easy it is then uh, for that to be transmitted to the children in, in the community who have not yet met the virus. And from that, the children will get you involved. So that's one story which I think, uh, of course I bias because I work on these viruses, but it's pretty magic, isn't it, really? Tuberculosis, I couldn't resist putting in this picture which I found in the British Medical Journal a couple of years ago. Um, it's, it's long uh, been a controversy, really, when TB first became a problem in, in humans. 
Uh, but if this uh, is to be believed, that this is actually a skull bone of a young male Homo erectus, one of our ancient, ancient ancestors, uh, which was found in Western Turkey and thought to be about 500,000 years old. Um, and it's said to show signs of uh, TB meningitis. The arrow points to the edge of the orbit here, the eye socket, and I, I'm no expert on fossils, but uh, I can assure you that uh, this rather ragged edge here uh, is apparently suggestive of TB meningitis. And if that is the case, then obviously tuberculosis is another chronic persistent infection which could have infected our ancestors and uh, in a similar way to the herpes virus could pass from one generation to another and not be bothered by the fact that there were just very few isolated bands around. Finally, trypanosomiasis or sleeping sickness. Uh, this is um, for us a tropical disease which occurs in Central Africa and is caused by um, this nasty little protozoa here. Here it is swimming in the blood of, of somebody, an infected individual. And again, this is thought to be an ancient infection. But actually, it's not a natural infection of humans. It naturally affects the African uh, wild game on, on the African plains. And uh, it's done so for uh, many, many millennia. It's spread between them by the tsetse fly, uh, this nasty beast here. And in fact, it causes no problem in the wild uh, African game. But if a microbe laden tsetse fly happens to bite a human, uh, then the disease that it causes is 100% fatal sleeping sickness. It can be treated these days, but obviously uh, the hunter gatherer bands who were um, hunting in that area uh, would have had a real problem with this. Um, if you think about it, in, in a band of uh, 25 to 50, there may be, say, uh, three or four active young male hunters, and of course they would be the ones who would be coming into contact with the African game, and they would be the most likely to become infected. And historians uh, really feel that um, the hunter-gatherer bands could not have survived long term in the trypanosomiasis <coughs> belt in, in Africa. And I've just got a picture to show you, this is the geographical distribution of sleeping sickness today. It's actually determined by the tsetse fly. Um, the, the geographical distribution of the tsetse fly determines where this disease occurs. And it's thought to be very similar, have been very similar um, all those years ago. So modern man evolved in Africa 200,000 years ago, we know that. And there was an exodus from Africa, Africa around 50,000 years ago, um, shown here, to eventually populate the rest of the world. Um, and uh, experts believe that, uh, as I've said, the hunter-gatherer bands couldn't have survived in the Tripistone Belt, and therefore uh, that man's exodus from Africa uh, was thought to be caused, at least in part, by that tiny Tripistone. So I now want to take a, a big leap um, to the farming era and to say that if you've been born any time um, from about 8,500 BC onwards, in certain areas at least, um, you would have had a very different sort of lifestyle from a hunter-gatherer because uh, around about that time, the farming era began in the fertile crescent, which is this area called Mesopotamia by the Romans. It's in modern day Iraq and Iran. Uh, between the rivers Euphrates and Tigris. And uh, there, uh, at that time, they began to domesticate wheat, goats, and sheep. And uh, following on from that, other centers independently also um, developed domestication. China, about 7,500 years ago, with rice. Um, Papua New Guinea, about 7,000 BC. Sorry, BC, I should say. Um, Africa, a couple of centers, about 5,000 BC. And interesting, the Americas are rather later, uh, 3,500 to 2,500 BC. And I'll come back to that when I talk about the globalization of uh, microbes in a few minutes. So a huge change in lifestyle. Instead of wandering from place to place, our ancestors were now living in permanent village settlements, um, something rather like this. Um, which is Scarra Bray on Orkney, where I don't know if any of you have visited that uh, settlement, but if you do, you see just how tiny um, and uh, crowded these villages really were. 
the people were, for the first time, in really close contact with each other. Um, they were living in permanent dwellings, and therefore they stored their food and water, rather than um, collecting it fresh every day and then moving on. Uh, their, their sewage and waste material accumulated around their dwellings, which hadn't happened before. And most importantly of all, perhaps, they shared their dwellings with these recently dom domesticated animals. So an enormous revolution uh, occurred, and uh, microbes had an absolute field day. Uh, for many reasons, uh, they found spreading between individuals uh, a lot easier than they had before. Um, but the main reason uh, was uh, that man had domesticated animals, and these animals had their own microbes, and these microbes, many of them, were able to jump um, from the animals to the humans which were in such close contact for the first time. It must have been a very unhealthy time for the poor old early farmers. Um, these microbes, which we now know as the acute infectious microbes, or called the crowd diseases, uh, are all ones that uh, jumped from animals to man in the early farming era and were, in fact, the emerging infections of the farming era. Uh, microbes that jump from, an uh, from animals to man are called zoonoses. Um, and then, of course, they learnt quite quickly um, to spread between humans. Uh, initially, I guess, they had to jump uh, just to one individual and infect that individual and jump to another individual. But then they quickly learnt to spread between humans and cause small epidemics. Um, they thrived, as I said, in the filthy, crowded farming villages. Of course they did. Uh, they caused recurrent epidemics. Um, but, of course, they induced long-term immunity, just like the flu virus does. And so, in order to actually become a human pathogen and not have to jump from an animal source to start an epidemic, uh, there had to be a minimal number of susceptible hosts so that they didn't die out at the end of each epidemic. Um, with the molecular uh, era, we've been able, well, not me personally, but virologists have been able to look and see uh, where some of these uh, viruses came from. Um, it was always thought until recently that smallpox actually came from cattle, from cowpox. Uh, but recently, uh, looking at the genome of smallpox virus, which causes this terrible rash here, you can see, um, it turns out that uh, smallpox virus is most closely related to the camelpox virus and the gerbil pox virus. Um, and here is the smallpox virus. So it's thought, actually, that it was the gerbil pox virus that transferred probably about 5,000 BC uh, to both humans and camels, um, probably in the fertile crescent where camels were domesticated and where gerbils were also scurrying around, I guess, in the uh, newly made villages, uh, picking up what they could in the way of food. And they were all coming into much closer contact than they ever had previously. Um, we know that smallpox uh, is an ancient disease, and I hope that you can see um, this. This is the mummy of King Ramesses V, who died quite suddenly in um, 1157 BC in Egypt, while he was just in his early 30s. And when they unwrapped the mummy of this king, uh, they saw lesions, which I hope you can see on his face there. Can you see them, or should we turn the lights down? OK, right. A big one there, anyway. Uh, and on his nose, a bump there. Um, and these have been biopsied, and virus-like particles have been seen in them. So it's extremely likely that this young king actually died of smallpox. Measles is another one um, which uh, has been looked into from uh, the genomic point of view. And it's shown that measles genome is most closely related to the rinderpest virus and to a lesser extent uh, to the canine distemper virus. Uh, the latter is a, uh, a virus of dogs. And the rinderpest virus um, is one actually that's just been eliminated worldwide, but which used to cause cattle play, terrible disease um, in cattle. Um, and so it's thought that uh, the measles virus uh, originated from the rinderpest virus, and the two diverged, it's been worked out, about 2,000 years ago. So these are two of the viruses, anyway, that, that jumped uh, during the farming era. 
Now, I, I hinted that uh, the viruses couldn't, or the, the microbes, couldn't make the break completely with an animal source uh, until there were enough humans in a population for them to be able to circulate continuously. Um, and it's been worked out quite cleverly with measles virus uh, that you need a population of about half a million for the measles virus to circulate continuously. Um, that's been worked out by looking at measles epidemics on islands uh, in a different size of populations. Iceland, for example, Fiji, they've done studies. And, th and they've worked out that if you have more than 500,000 people, then it can circulate continuously. Enough babies are born uh, so that the thing can come around every couple of years and infect the, the young children. And it, it's also known that cities of this size arose in Mesopotamia for the first time about 5,000 years ago. Uh, so it seems again to fit um, quite nicely with the uh, genomic data that, that these viruses or microbes were able then um, to become entirely human um, microbes and to evolve separately from their animal origin. And of course, once that happened, they then were spread widely among the human population by traders, travelers, armies, uh, anybody who was traveling from one city to another could carry these viruses and cause an epidemic uh, in a large, naive population. And eventually, of course, they spread all over um, the old world. It's reckoned that by about uh, 1200 AD, there was a common infectious pool throughout the whole of the old world. And uh, so these uh, so-called emerging infections were now causing the cyclical childhood epidemics um, that we saw until uh, recently when vaccination uh, put a stop to most of them. And this just shows you um, the epidemics of measles uh, from 1928 to 1964 when the vaccine came out. You can see every couple of years it would come around, causing a spike of cases, massive epidemic there, um, and on it would go, infecting children as it went. But um, over the years, because they were now entirely human uh, pathogens, genetic resistance could evolve. Uh, the microbes would weed out the weakest in our populations, so it would kill them, and therefore leaving those with the um, best resistance to uh, these microbes, and therefore the diseases probably became less severe. Now, a couple of, I just want to go tell you about a couple of um, microbes which really thrived in um, the developing uh, towns and cities, which of course, like the villages, were uh, very densely populated, were filthy, and uh, really ideal conditions for uh, viruses like smallpox to thrive. And this was one of the real killers. As I'm sure you know, it's an airborne virus, it's, it thrives in crowded conditions. It's the world's number one killer virus even now. It killed about 300 million people just in the 20th century alone, and nobody was counting before that. Um, it gives this horrible rash. It's extremely painful. It's fatal in about 30% of cases. And even the survivors uh, may be blinded and certainly scarred. And this was going on until uh, Jenner discovered a vaccination at the end of the 18th century and the virus, as I'm sure you know, was eventually eradicated uh, in 1980. So a really a terrible virus with a terrible history. And uh, I have to show you this, but partly because it's Scottish and partly because, uh, for me anyway, uh, this is uh, how smallpox virus can really be shown to have changed the course of history. Um, in the 17th century, it wiped out the House of Stuart. And here I have the family tree of the House of Stuart, starting with Charles I, uh, who, if you remember, had his head chopped off, so he didn't have the opportunity to die of smallpox. But, but those, um, in the, in, those I've highlighted in blue did die of smallpox. Um, so he was eventually followed by his uh, son, Charles II. Um, Charles II died with no legitimate offspring. Uh, he was followed by James um, the, the Second, who wasn't popular and eventually uh, gave way to his sister, Mary. Am I right? No, that's Princess Mary, sorry, to his, to, to his niece, uh, Mary II. He, they had already lost a sister and a brother to smallpox. Uh, Mary married William of Orange and died very quickly after coming to the throne with no children uh, of smallpox. And so she, after, well, after William of Orange died, she was followed by Anne, um, who had one son, Prince William, who died of smallpox. So that was the end of the Stuarts. Um, 
And within 80 years of that, as I've got listed here, smallpox killed Louis I of Spain, Louis XV of France, Eureka Eleonora of Sweden, and Peter II of Russia. So, you know, I, I'm saying that it was a disease of poverty and crowding, but it clearly uh, did not spare the royal families of Europe, and uh, it, it was quite devastating. Of course, the other uh, devastating disease around uh, was bubonic plague, and I know uh, we all know about this at school, so I'm not going to harp on about it uh, too long, but um, again, a, a really devastating disease, and this time, like the sleeping sickness, um, but this is not a natural infection of humans. It naturally infects wild rodents and is spread between them by rat fleas. Um, and epidemics really only start when house rats get infected. This is a house rat, a black rat. And these rats are rather delicate little creatures. Well, not little creatures. Uh, they came originally from the Himalayas and they don't like the cold. So they live in close contact with humans. They still do, but in, you know, in days gone by, every house had its own rat colony. And, and so humans really couldn't get away with them, from them. Not only that, but they are highly susceptible to the plague and they die of it rapidly. And the rat fleas, desperately looking for some, for some blood meal, will then jump onto humans and bite them. And that's when the disease spreads to humans. It's 30% fatal. Um, but if it becomes pneumonic plague, i.e. spread um, through the lungs into the air, then it's 100% fatal. Um, there have been three pandemics of plague uh, over the centuries. The first one um, being called the Justinian plague at the time of Justinian here, um, hit Con Constantinople in 542 AD and spread rapidly through the whole of the Roman Empire. Lasted 200 years, would you believe, and killed about 100 million people. The second one is the one that we know most about, and that's the Black Death, uh, which raged uh, in the UK, at least, from 1346 to 1353. Um, this began in the Far East, um, in a, a Viennese tra trading center on the Black Sea. And when, um, oh, the Genoese, sorry, and when the Genoese uh, saw what was happening, they jumped into their galleys and shot back, stopping off at Constantinople to drop off a few microbes, then stopping off at Sicily to drop off a few more, uh, before returning to Italy, and really um, that got the whole thing going. Um, presumably, they didn't actually drop off microbes, but they dropped off infected rats, uh, because it has to come to, from rats and rat fleas. And it spread throughout the whole of Europe, North, of, um, North Africa uh, and Asia, um, and it also continued for a very long time and finally disappeared from Europe in the 1720s. So that was the second uh, pandemic of plague. And you may be surprised to hear that the third pandemic of plague is actually still ongoing. Uh, it began in China in the late 19th century, but was really not noticed until it reached Hong Kong in 1894. Uh, this is a picture of Hong Kong court today. Um, and as you can see, a, a massive um, a port area with uh, trade coming from all over the world. And actually, it wasn't dissimilar in, uh, the, at, these, um, at this time. And of course, the rats um, colonized the ships and spread via international shipping lanes uh, virtually all over the world. There was an outbreak in San Francisco when a boat arrived there in 1900. And this established a plague focus in the Americas which I think is interesting because people don't really know that. Um, a plague focus is an underground city of rodents which carry the, the plague microbe. And as I say, it's spread between them by uh, their fleas and they don't really um, succumb to anything. Um, and it's only when it gets out of these plague foci to infect domestic rat rats and then humans that the problem arises. So you will see that there is no plague focus in Europe. So if we were to have a plague, a plague come here, it would have to be introduced from outside of Europe. But this plague focus in the United States, which started in California, is spreading actually quite rapidly right across the states. And they do get two or three uh, in infections with the plague every year. But of course, these days, it can be treated with antibiotics. So it's not as frightening as it sounds. But it is quite remarkable that um, they, they have this plague focus established recently and spreading quite fast. So, so far,
far, I've only been talking about the old world and, and the microbes, uh, but I want now to jump to the new world and look at globalization of microbes. Um, so if you remember, uh, humans crossed the Bering Strait uh, from Siberia to Alaska when it was a land bridge, probably about 14,000 years ago. The land bridge then sub uh, submerged at the end of the last ice age, around about 10,000 years ago, and the Americas became one very large isolated island. And contact was only really re-established between the new and the old world in 1492, when, if my school days told me right, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And the colonization of the Americas was the most, one of the most dramatic things that happened to the population of America. Before the arrival of the Europeans in 1492, they had no crowd diseases there, uh, despite the fact that the Incas and the Aztecs had very large populations. They had crowded cities, and here I've got Machu Picchu. I don't know if any of you have been there, but again, you can see if you go there, the very crowded um, little tiny dwellings that people lived in ideal for um, these crowd diseases. But the reason that they didn't have them is probably because, as I pointed out earlier, they only domesticated animals rather late, and the, by the time they got round to it, they'd actually killed off most of the herd animals, and all they had left to domesticate were llamas, turkeys, guinea pigs, and dogs. And, and it can only be that these animals didn't carry microbes that uh, jumped to humans. So. As far as we can tell, they were a pretty healthy population as far as infections were concerned before the Europeans arrived. And you can just imagine what happened. They were a large population, they had crowded, dirty cities, they had no immunity to any of these microbes and no genetic resistance. And these microbes absolutely poured into the Americas. I, I've listed some of them here, but you know, there were literally hundreds of them they had not met before. It was a disaster. East to west spread, uh, European explorers, travelers, traders all went across in, in these kind of boats, carrying acute infectious microbes with them. And there was a 90% drop in the population of the Americas uh, in 50 years. Whole cultures, whole communities, languages were lost uh, to infectious diseases. Uh, of course, the Europeans were there to exploit. Um, they set up sugarcane plantations in the Caribbean. They wanted um, the American population to work there and uh, to um, provide sugar for the uh, apparently inexhaustible sweet tooth of Europe. But as the, the Native Americans were dying, their, their solution was to bring African slaves across. And of course the Africans brought with them malaria and yellow fever to add to the pot. And it, it really was, uh, as you can see, a totally disastrous era. But eventually, just as in the old world, uh, by uh, 1700, the Eurasian microbes had dispersed throughout the Americas and settled down into the uh, epidemic pattern that we've seen um, in Europe. And of course, the Americans weren't the only place uh, to suffer like this. Other isolated communities like uh, Australia, Tasmania, Fiji, all these places suffered. Uh, the indigenous population suffered in the same way. I was going to do a quick reading there from my book, I had five time for this, um, just to tell you um, the, the Europeans, of course, the Spanish, um, conquered the Incas and the Aztecs with uh, ease, and that was really because of these uh, infectious diseases that were, that were hitting the population, and particularly smallpox. And this was written by a Native American at the time, um, so I'm just going to quote it to you, um, talking about smallpox. It spread over the people as a great destruction. Uh, some it quite covered on all parts, their faces, their heads, their breasts. There was great havoc, very many died of it. They could not walk. They only lay in their resting places and beds. They could not move. They could not stir. They could not change position, nor lie on one side, nor face down, nor on their backs. And if they stirred, much did they cry out. Great was its destruction, covered, mantled with pustules, very many people died of them. So you can see that uh, with that sort of chaos, very few Spanish troops managed to conquer. 
uh, but really um, the whole of the Incas and the Aztecs, which were flourishing populations at the time. Now, I'm often asked, uh, okay, I talk about east to west spread. Was there anything that spread from west to east? And the most likely candidate is actually syphilis, uh, which appeared in Europe in 1494, uh, coinciding with the return of Columbus's uh, sailors from the Caribbean. Um, these sailors uh, joined Charles VIII uh, of France as he was, uh, his army, as he was trying to occupy Naples. And uh, it seems that they probably brought syphilis back with them, and it spread very rapidly, of course, in the conditions that an army live under. Uh, and then when the army was disbanded, Charles himself actually suffered from syphilis. When the army was disbanded and everybody went back to their own countries, uh, it spread extremely rapidly uh, throughout Europe, Asia, and North, America, uh, North Africa in just six years. And at that time, it was an acute and fatal disease. And I just have another quote from my book that I've written on the slide this time to, say, to show you that not much changes. There was a lot of finger pointing going on. So the Italians called it the French disease, the French the disease of Naples, the Poles the German disease, and the Russians the Polish disease. In the Middle East it was named the European pustule, in India the Franks, in China the Arsenal Canton, and in Japan Tang Saw. So that rather actually um, reminds me of the beginning of the HIV uh, pandemic, actually, when everybody was saying it must have come from somewhere else. Okay, so um, to summarize, uh, I hope you, that you will agree with me that the factors involved in the evolution of acute infectious disease epidemics are uh, primarily exposure to animal microbes, and of course the invention of farming uh, potentiated that, crowding with the growth of towns and cities, Travel to spread the microbes in a much wider area with traders, armies, and, armies and explorers. And of course, poverty, uh, living in poor conditions, potentiates the spread of microbes. So, just looking at those factors today, um, I don't want to depress you too much, but to be honest, I don't think we've moved far. So, mod in modern times, crowding, uh, here are the facts. This is a shanty town in South America. No sewage disposal, no clean water. Uh, you can see that you know microbes have a field day there. There are now over six billion people in the world. Uh, by the end of the century, it's predicted there'll be nine billion. Over half of us are now living in cities, with mega cities like Tokyo, 34 million. Microbes are loving it. We're playing into their hands. Poverty, you know, uh, 17 million people still die annually from. Uh, microbe infections. We don't see them. 95% of these people are in resource poor countries. They are living day to day in conditions like this, and again, microbes are having a field day. 1.5 billion people have no access to clean water, and HIV has shown us uh, one in three people in South African cities are suffering from HIV. Microbes are still spreading. Travel. What can I say? Over a billion of us board international flights every day to and from, uh, sorry, annually to and from 200 countries. Um, and the rapid movement of people uh, has never been so great. This is a picture of the Hajj uh, with uh, pilgrims there. As you can see in terribly crowded conditions and um, microbes like cholera, for example, uh, regularly break out in these kind of populations. And I think it's interesting to look at this um, information, the collapse of travel time, so forth, because if you look at the travel time from the UK to Australia, in the 18th century it took a year by sailing galley, in the 19th century it took 100 days by clipper, beginning of the 20th century it took 50 days by steamer, and now you can get there in a day. So again, you know, my coat, I bet they can't believe they're not. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you what, to get measles to Australia by galley, it, one person incubating measles had to get on the boat. There had to be a series of six people who were susceptible to measles and caught it on the boat for it to step off at the other end. But it did it. You know, it actually more or less wiped out the population of Tasmania. So you can imagine today, well, you only have to look at the SARS uh, epidemic to see that uh, microbes travel by jet. So here we have it, the modern times. Uh, we have an increasing number of emerging uh, microbes at the moment, despite everything that we know. 
they're emerging at the uh, rate of about one a year. They again jump from animals. They are rapidly distributed by travellers and they are often highly lethal. And I don't know if you know the story at the beginning of the SARS pandemic, but it was a local infection in Guangdong province in China until one doctor who had been treating cases in the hospital travelled from Guangdong to Hong Kong to go to a wedding. He uh, went to stay in the Metropole Hotel, he got into the lift, and as the lift was going up, he sneezed. And that sneeze was enough to infect 17 people who were then travelling off the next day to, uh, well, all over the world. And, and that is actually how the SARS virus uh, took off. He died in the hospital a few days later, but meanwhile, people have reached all sorts of other countries setting off uh, epidemics in those countries. And I just want to end up by telling you about a couple of emerging infections that you may not know about, uh, but they have been followed up very carefully by epidemiologists, and, and we know now where they came from. So Nipah virus emerged in, Malay in Malaysia in 1999. Uh, it's called after the village in which uh, the virus was isolated from, a farmer lived in the village. Uh, Nipper village. Um, so the first thing that happened was uh, farmed pigs developed a respiratory disease um, and everybody was puzzling over that when the farmers then developed encephalitis, um, which was 50% fatal and it also spread to abattoir workers um, and really got as far as Hong Kong before anybody worked out what was going on. And it turned out that this new virus um, had actually jumped from fruit bats to pigs. These fruit bats um, had been happily roosting in the rainforest uh, when they decided in Malaysia to build a new airport and they chopped down the trees that the uh, fruit bats were roosting in and so the fruit bats flew off and found another roost above the pig farms and their droppings rained down containing this virus into the, onto the pigs and the pigs caught the virus. Of course the virus causes no problems in the fruit bat uh, but it did infect the pigs. And so that was the chain of events that happened um, in that particular situation. One other for you before I finish. Monkeypox, uh, which has been known for a long time uh, to, be, uh, to, to occur sometimes in Africa. It's misnamed because it's actually carried by rodents, not by monkeys. Uh, it causes a disease that is similar to smallpox with that nasty rash, but fortunately not as fatal. And it suddenly emerged in the United States in 2003, causing 71 cases before it was finally tracked down. And it turned out to be arriving in the United States in a giant Gambian rat, which was imported uh, from Ghana for the exotic pet trade. Now, how many people here have got a giant Gambian rat at home? <laughs> I mean, really? You know, who wants one of those things? But anyway, this rat was housed in a pet shop next to the prairie dogs. It carried this virus which didn't cause it any problem, but it jumped to the prairie dogs. Uh, they were bought by people before they got sick. The prairie dogs then got sick and the owners then developed money. So another story, you know, of the modern era where we're jetting Gambian rats around the place. Um, you know, God help us really. I thought I'd better mention uh, flu because um, bird flu, is this going to be the next pandemic? I think so, probably. Of course, all us virologists thought that it was going to be the flu pandemic and then flu, a milder form of flu actually emerged in Mexico. But um, this could be a really serious one and it, it is being watched very closely and of course people will do everything they can to stop it. But uh, viruses have a habit of finding a way. So this one first emerged in Hong Kong in 1997. It spread uh, to poultry flocks in the Far East. It's now uh, infecting birds in 18 countries. It's been found in Scotland um, and indeed other places in the US. And it, it's mutating fast and a few more mutations uh, to allow it to spread between uh, individuals. And it will be right for, for another pandemic. So are we better off than our ancestors were? Well, I'll leave you to decide. But yes, we have more scientific knowledge. Yes, we have more resources. We have antimicrobials, money, technology, manpower. We have a rapid response rate. And I must say that the way that we control SARS, I think, was impressive so far as I've put there, because it might re-emerge at any minute. 
Um, but we still don't get it right. The resources aren't distributed equally. Poverty is still rife. There's a lack of global cooperation. Antibiotic resistance is moving. Global warming is moving. And there is another pandemic on the horizon. So I'd just like to end up by saying global problems need global solutions. And let's hope that we can find some. Thank you for listening.